Snagging Benjamins is not for everyone. Side effects may include euphoria, increased ability to meet your goals, and aggression from people wondering, quote, what the hell your secret is. Stacking Benjamins may be habit-forming, especially if you stick around for the entire episode. Wink, wink. Please check with your doctor to see if Stacking Benjamins is right for you. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and get ready to get relevant. Today, we're taking you to interviews Joe did live from the Relevant Conference at the Cosmopolitan Hotel last month in Las Vegas. You'll hear all about innovations coming to a credit union near you so you can make better money decisions. Plus, that's not all. We'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky stacker who wants to know how to more efficiently diversify her investments. And of course, no show is complete without my mind-bending trivia question. And now, two guys who are always relevant, like at a biker bar, it's Joe and O J J J J G. Of course, at a biker bar, they don't say "suns out, guns out" for no reason. Like when I walk in, just bam, Just there it is. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Don't mess with me. Hey, everybody, welcome to Wednesday on the Stacky Benjamin Show. We've got a great episode as we take you out to Las Vegas, as Doug so succinctly told you ahead of time. I have been giving some uh, some talks lately. This was not a keynote. I was actually hired to be the MC. And while I was out there, I'm like, there is so much here. There's so much goodness, OG, that I have to I have to put a microphone in, some, in front of some of these people because, you know, credit unions, credit unions, let's be clear, they may not have all of the marketing muscle that a bank will have like a bank of america will just out market a credit union all day long with those huge budgets well, they'll outspend them well good point <laughs> yeah. but a, but a credit union is member owned and they have all these fantastic services you know what you're talking about last week about the library with the net mm. it's just like just like you know not not the same thing as your local library but there are lots of financial education programs there's all kinds of good stuff so we uh we brought that to the forefront uh, uh, today as I went out to Las Vegas. You've been to Vegas lately, OG? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was there uh, to see Garthy Brooksy, as you recall. Oh, over that's Memorial right. Day weekend. Why do we you call him that? Yes. In the big G. Garthy Brooksy, was, uh, is he like four years old? Yeah, well, I mean, they're on a first name basis. Come Everybody's here, got a pet name when it's you and you and Garthy, Brooksy. put the toad down. I like how he has his symbol is just a lowercase g in like Times New Roman font. Really? You like steal that from me? Is that it? I think so. Dude, stealing it from me, I think. Uh, speaking of, by the way, there, there there's some things we have to we have to tell everybody today. First of all, we got a big celebration coming up, guys. We got a huge celebration coming up. Uh, Kate, who was on the show, of course, last week, she has a milestone birthday. Let's put it that way. Milestone birthday. So we thought Let's have a birthday celebration. We're going to give away a set of Sennheiser wireless over-ear headphones. These uh, noise-canceling headphones, by the way, same same product Sennheiser that NPR uses to make their podcasts that are nearly as good as ours. Those are the good ones, nearly, right? Nearly. Nearly as good as, yeah, fantastic thing. But if you'd like a set of Sennheiser wireless headphones to help us celebrate Kate's birthday celebration, go to stackybenjamins.com slash birthday bash. Now, here's the deal. This is, we thought, all right, we got to keep the surround sound going. So in honor of Kate's birthday, if you sign up for the 201, you will get an entry because we want to make sure you bring the surround sound. We got the 101 here for people that don't know about it. The 201 is our newsletter, comes out the day after each uh, Monday, Wednesday podcast. You'll get signed up for that and you get an entry. If you already get the 201, we remember you if you refer a friend to the 201. They will, of course, your friend will get signed up for the Sennheiser wireless awesome headphones. And so will, so will you for referring them. And of course, everybody inside the 201, you have your own referral code. Make sure you use your referral code. Or use mine. <laughs> or, or use mine. Right? <laughs> in, front, in front of, uh, inside each uh, 201, you'll find your unique referral code. So make sure you use that and we'll be able to see it. And we'll send you a confirmation that, yep, we saw it and you are registered. 
just a couple weeks, but uh, get started here early. StackingBenjamins.com slash birthday bash to get in on uh, the big celebration to celebrate Kate's birthday. How about that? And then we got a couple other things, OG. This is an important one. You ready for this one? I'm sure. How about here? I'm just yeah. going to play this for you. Is that, is that all there is or is there more? Oh, of course there's more. Hold on. You got it? Perfect. Understood completely. We're going to take you live out to Las Vegas uh, here in just a moment. So let's get moving. All right, no headline today. We're going to kick things off, though, with my interview with the creator of the Relevant Conference, Jeff Klein. I just caught up with him now that the Relevant Conference is over to talk to him about exactly how the Relevant Conference was created and how credit unions can have a bigger impact on the community they serve. And here's the man who created the conference we're going to talk about today. He's from Choice Creative Solutions, Jeff Klein. How are you, man? Oh, wonderful. You know, I, the only the way I can be better if there was a little sunshine uh, over my shoulder here, but uh, we'll power through somehow. I know. Unfortunately, we're not going to have video for this, but I've got video. I've got you taking a much-deserved vacation after the amazing conference you put on. But you also have an incredible T-shirt on for us today, I noticed. That's right. Uh, you know, it's a shame that uh, you know, everybody can't see it, but it says Dad Bod. Uh, which I wear like a badge of honor. And so uh, that'll be on display for all the folks down here at the lake this week. Well, it definitely was a tone conference you put on. How about that for a segue, Jeff? You put well, on some fantastic days with some great speakers. But let's talk about this. Just to kick off the interviews people are about to hear, why did you decide that credit unions needed a conference like Relevant? This really spawned from the idea that most credit unions are fairly risk adverse, uh, and, and rightfully so, right? They're using their members' money. They're not directed by a, a board. Uh, any profits go back to members uh, in the form of lower rates or uh, dividends. And so rightfully so, credit unions for a long time have been very uh, risk adverse. They kind of live in a tan and tilt world. And we think for credit unions to maintain relevancy, they've got to step outside of that. They have to play by the rules of retail banking. There are ways we believe you can do that while you know, maintaining your integrity Clearly, there are some big banks that have, uh, you know, been hit with fines uh, just in the last few weeks, even some pretty large ones. And credit, we're not suggesting credit unions should completely step outside of what's made them unique. But we do think that, you know, one of the worst things that can happen to a financial institution is to become irrelevant because irrelevancy leads to insolvency. And so that's what this conference is about. It's bringing together the right people, the right speakers, uh, the right partners, and having one true focus. And that's how do you maintain relevance with your financial institution? There were some disturbing statistics that I saw. One was that, that there are a lot of people out there, and it's mostly because of marketing overspend, where people trust some of these big banks you're talking about more than they trust their local credit union. And credit unions, to your point, Jeff, owned by their members. So that needs to be flipped back upside down again, I think. Absolutely. And I think that one of the greatest advantages that credit unions have is the fact that they are owned by members and they're governed by uh, a board um, that's a volunteer board that, that oftentimes, you know, has a sole purpose and that's to, you know, maintain relevancy. And obviously, you know, whether you're a bank or credit union, we all offer the same stuff, right? The same products, the same consumer loans, the same checking accounts. There, there might be little bits of variance here or there. But at the end of the day, how do you connect with your community? How do you, you know, show up and provide relevancy to the community you serve. And, and that's where I think credit unions, again, can make such an impact is the fact that the people who are, you know, using the products at credit unions, they're using those for everyday means, right? Big banks, you know, they have a place. And for the most part over the years, it's been in commercial banking and business banking. But, you know, talk to anybody on the street. When they're going to get a vehicle loan, where are they going? They're going to a credit union. When they, they're setting up their first accounts, you know, they're going to a credit union. But, you know, especially younger folks, you know, look at Zelle, look at the Apple card, look at Venmo, how easy it is to set up those accounts. That's where credit unions need to move. You know, they're, they're never going to have the, the tech budgets that uh, BOA, Chase, or Wells have. But there are great partners out there that can help with, with some of these relevant uh, products, especially right now, deposit products. And we just encourage all credit unions to think that way. Don't think of the credit union. Think as a retail organization, no different than the experience you have when you walk into an Apple store or a Best Buy. How do you create those experiences in your brick and mortar locations and also on your digital experience online. Well, and I was surprised to see, frankly, when I looked at the list of speakers that you had, this truly is for credit unions and for their members, frankly, who are going to get the benefit of this relevant truly is a technology conference. Yeah. To a large degree, you know, a lot of times you go to these conferences and 
they're in these huge conference centers and they have these big exhibit halls. And, you know, we've been on both sides of it where we've organized these events, but we've also attended, you know, and oftentimes, you know, you show up as a vendor and you're, you're in the exhibit hall and then the doors open and people start walking through like they're uh, trick or treating. They've got their bags out and they just want to see how many stress balls and, you know, <laughs> containers of, uh, you know, a uh, hand gel they can acquire over the next day or two. But what doesn't happen are those conversations about, you know, hey, tell us about your product. Tell us how it can make our credit union better. That's what we really try to do is identify partners to join us that are on the cutting edge of technology or just, you know, thought leadership. How are you doing things differently? You know, we had you know, great partners from across the industry and not one of them is doing business as usual, right? It's operating in a different world and understanding that you know, to maintain relevancy, you've got to continue pushing the edge, not just in your tech, but also in how you use it. Because at the end of the day, we firmly believe that for credit unions to be successful, there has to be a combination of high tech meets high touch. And so it's it's not just about the technology, because at the end of the day, again, we're a commodity business. Everyone has access to the same technology. How do you use it? How do you use it better? How do you use it more efficiently? Yeah, the take home that I took really on the plane ride back from Las Vegas was that it is that high tech that can make it high touch. You see so many banks, especially in my opinion, that use high tech to get away from that high touch and for credit unions to be able to do what they do really well already, their competitive advantage, using technology to get more than that was pretty amazing. That was my takeaway. As you were flying back from Vegas, though, Jeff, for you, your own conference, what was the biggest surprise that you got during those few days in Las Vegas? Well, I flew right to the Betty Ford Clinic after four days with these relevanters. <laughs> I needed a, to dry up. No, I'm, I'm joking. Um, one of the biggest takeaways I had is that putting on an event like we did at the Cosmo in itself isn't hard to do, right? You, they have great people there. Um, they have, you know, we didn't have to cook the food. You know, somebody else serves it. You know, we had to get people there and we had great partners that, that helped put on the event. But what really makes our conference stand out are the people who are attending. They're C-level leaders. They're people in the industry that are not wanting to do business as usual. And when they get together and they collaborate and they make connections, that's where, you know, the really exciting stuff happens in our industry because there needs to be a movement of young leadership. And you're seeing that in credit unions where there's kind of a changing of the guard um, where you have these CEOs that have been riding really high capital ratios into retirement because their metric for success was, well, you know, how can we retain capital? Well, let's not look at that new building. Let's not look at that new model for how we could grow our credit union. Instead, success has meant sitting on cash. And so um, we've got these CEOs now that are coming in from all kinds of different industries. And it's really exciting to see them together when they're collaborating, when they're talking about partnerships and what they're sharing, what they're doing at their financial institutions. That's where I had just a lot of great conversations and heard a lot of exciting things that are happening. And, and that's really what makes the event is, is the people, um, you know, whether it's the vendors, the attendees, that, that's what makes it unique. Or the MC, probably the MC is what you meant. I mean, there's certainly some of that too. Yeah, you did a fantastic job. Thank you again. <laughs> Stop, keep going. Stop, keep going. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is, that is. I hope what our stackers take away from this is that if you're not attending industry conferences, no matter what industry you're in, that just being in the same room with these people and beginning to create these conversations, every bit as good as the phenomenal speaker lineup, the fact that you get out from, you know, out from the trenches of what you're doing is so important. Jeff, thanks for taking some time away from your vacation. We'll let you get back to vacation, but thanks for a great event and uh, for kicking off today's special episode. I really appreciate it. Hey, you bet, man. Appreciate it. I think it is important, OG, that uh, people know what's going on at the credit union. As an example, uh, Jason Vitug going to credit unions around mm -hmm. the United States. Credit unions often have these financial education programs that banks don't have. They will have member benefit things going on. Like there's so much going on at your credit union, even if, even if they don't win the rate game against your bank, probably good to check them out from time to time anyway. I was going to say, but they likely do. <laughs> That's true they, too. They likely do win the rate game. Yeah. Don't they usually? And yet credit unions could be so much more, could be so mm -hmm. much more. One of the speakers on day one was a woman named Samantha Paxson. We talked to her when I covered the Think Conference in New York City back in 2017, and she's still beating the drum that credit unions should be beating the pants off of banks, which is exciting for all of us that are in any community where you might be able to be a part of a credit union. Here is uh, my interview from Relevant with Samantha Paxson talking about where she hopes credit unions go. 
And I'm here with Samantha Paxson, Chief Experience Officer for Co-op, right? Yes, Co-op Solutions, yes. yes. Good to see you. Yeah, I saw you back in 2017 and you rock the stage here at Relevant. Nice work. Thank you. Always good to see you, Joe, and have you back. It's great to be here. Well, thank you. I want to lead off with this because we talk a lot on the podcast about the difference between credit unions and banks. You're somebody that's trying to help credit unions create a better experience and a great a great story you told on stage is about your son and what he's looking for. Can we start with your son? Because A, I think it's really cool what he's thinking about at 11 years old. I think that's awesome. But then second, we can talk about that and kind of where you're looking to help credit unions go. Yes, I just talked about my son wanting to get involved in financial services. He's an 11-year-old boy, his name's Finn. And he said, Mom, I really want to have a debit card and I wanna know how I'm spending and I want to learn about investing. And should I join a credit union to do that? Or should I go with another company or a banker and something else that I would find on my phone? And I said, wow, Finn, sure. I know that you want to go hang out after your junior lifeguard program and go get an ice cream after being at the beach. And then you want to really understand how to manage your money. But investing, that was an exciting that was thing cool. for him to ask about. I wasn't thinking about investing at all in anything but ice cream, I guess, at 11 years old. <laughs> well, it's funny. He and his buddies have gotten in, interested in it. And one of his best friends, Tavin, opened up an Ameritrade account. And his parents put in $500, which is pretty significant. Sure. And he's learning about how to invest. And so Finn, my son, said, Mom, Tavin made $100 and he didn't do anything. <laughs> and so... I said, that's incredible. And he said, I want to learn how to do that. I want to better understand how to invest money and what that even means and how I would know which companies to invest in. And so he asked me, where should I go do that? How can I get the right set of products for me and which company should I do business with? And as his mom, I, I work in the credit union industry, and he knows that credit unions are always the provider that does the right thing for the consumer, that they're about people, not profits. Yeah, we're nonprofit. We have uh, members, not customers. So it seems like we're in alignment. Yes. The thing that he wasn't quite sure of is how do I understand what a credit union is going to be able to offer me and how would I put those solutions together based on what I'm looking for? I mean, it's a pretty sophisticated ask for an 11 year old, but it's a great example of really what today's consumer is looking for. They're looking for a personalized set of solutions delivered digitally that are going to help them with their short-term financial needs and their long-term financial needs, which was essentially what my son was doing. He says, I want to know how I can spend the money that I earn from doing chores around the house and do it digitally. I want to have a debit card and a phone that I can see how I'm spending. And then I'm really interested in long-term solutions on how can I invest and grow wealth? He's like, I want to be rich when I grow up, mom. He's like, help me know what that looks like and how to do that. So. That's so cool. Somebody wants to stack Benjamins at 11. I just, I just still think that's incredible. And your point was credit unions are a unique spot to be able to deliver on that. And certainly, much like banks, they're falling short now. But you've got this vision of the future where a credit union could be a place where we could have more of that. Tell me about that. Any company, regardless of what industry you're in, that isn't focused on the consumer and designing everything around the consumer is missing the mark. And so credit unions have kind of leaned on a product-centric model for the last 20, 30 years and have focused their value proposition on being rate-driven. My 11-year-old son is not focused on rates. He doesn't understand that. He doesn't care about the difference between a 3% a 4% rate on the money market versus a bank. No. And most consumers, unless they're shopping for something really specific, they're really interested in understanding their overall financial position and being able to take the next best action. And I feel like, Samantha, if they're rate driven now and they come to the credit union, they're going to be rate driven later on. And the second you don't have the better rate, they're gone. 
Exactly. I mean, that's what we've seen in the credit union space, that they'll come to you for a rate, but yeah. then they'll leave you within the year. So you have to have a stronger value proposition. And this whole idea of improving financial wellness, financial performance, optimizing financial performance of people like you and me mm -hmm. is really what the consumer is looking for. And the people like you and me are very empowered. We can go open a Venmo account, a Robinhood account, an Ameritrade account. We can have relationships with several banks. We have our mortgage, our insurance, all of these different things that we do in our financial lives. And it can be overwhelming. It can be really hard to understand, how am I doing? And then be able to put those all of those different relationships together and have an aggregate view of your overall financial performance and know what that means for you in the short term. Am I going to be able to pay my bills every month and buy what I need to buy and have money for an emergency like your car breaking down or you or even saving for something that you want to take a vacation versus long term financial performance. When can I retire? Right. How am I do I need to have as much in my 401k as I have in liquid? How do I go about changing my behavior? as a budgeter or a non-budgeter and improve my daily choices to help those short-term goals and those long-term goals. And that's where the financial services industry really has an opportunity to offer more guidance and more support in the solutions that they deliver. I was super excited and empowered when I heard you talk about that on the stage just a few minutes ago. And I'm so happy you told me a little bit more about it today. Good seeing you again, by the way. I feel like it's been too long. It has been too long, Joe. <laughs> it's so good to see you. And so always good to hear about what's happening at Stacking Benjamins. I love OG that she talked about her son and how at 11 years old, he's interested in, in investing. When I was 11 years old, man, I didn't, I didn't think at all. I didn't think at all about investing. You were investing in Hot Wheels. I was. What were you investing in, OG? OG, you were investing in, uh, weren't you selling candy to all of your friends? So interestingly, when I was 11, I actually got my first job. I was a paper boy in our small town when I was 11, and I made $200 a month, which Holy you know, it's a million dollars to an 11 year old. I literally went to the corner store one time and I bought all the Laffy Taffies because they were a nickel <laughs> a piece. And I was like, I'm just going to keep in groups of 20, you know, because I have so much money. So very early after I started working, I went to the bank and I sat down with the Franklin Templeton mutual fund sales rep at the bank. And my mom thought I was crazy. And so that's how I bought my first car was I invested in Franklin Templeton Mutual Funds. How about that? Wow. Yeah, from 11 to 15. Well, and Samantha's point, all of these uh, stats now show that kids trust banks more than they trust their local credit union. And it's just because they don't know what's going on at the credit union. Yeah. And credit union's not doing a good enough job of getting the word out. Like, man, when, when, I, you know, when I heard that 11-year-olds are trusting Bank of America more than their credit union... <laughs> Well, I wish I would have learned also the the power of letting your money sit because nobody told me, hey, dummy, don't take all of your investments and cash it out to a depreciating asset for, you know, for that you're going to wreck right. three times. <laughs> like that would have been swelled to know at 16, mom, thanks. Yeah. So I think there's like a second level of that investing slash education piece, which is, you know, time is your friend. And if you happen to start early and just stay out of the way of compounding. That's an important component. Yeah, that that survey is kind of bogus. I mean, it's just all about name recognition. If you then said, who do you trust more with your money, Taylor Swift or Bank of America? They're going to give Taylor Swift all their money. I mean, Maybe. It, it, they have nothing to base their tr financial trust on at 11 years old. But the point is, Doug, when they first doing their first saving, when they first set up their first relationship with a, with a financial institution, we know how sticky those are. Mm -hmm. And so that name recognition goes a long way. I mean, there is another, there is another, just to do a little rip in here, there's another podcaster who decided to join the iHeartRadio network just because she thought that iHeartRadio was, she grew up with the name iHeartRadio. She doesn't know that they called it iHeartRadio because they destroyed the name they had before that and everybody hated the name they had, Clear Channel. Like if you know the things that iHeart has done, there's no iHeart in iHeart. Sorry, iHeart wow. fans, to for me to Dang, poke Joe. your balloon. But they You're did. Just eviscerating them. Just go do some history. If you just go look at some history, iHeart, anybody who's been in radio will tell you, iHeart single, singly destroyed FM radio. I should have asked Jeff Simoleon about it back on Monday. But if we grew up with Bank of America, we don't know. Like, we, we don't have any idea. 
So I think uh, I think it's important for credit unions to be able to get the word out and to have, frankly, to Samantha's point, products and services, especially services, right, that kids really can help them do well with their money and give them good financial education from the beginning. All right, we got three more interviews coming. We're going to do a recap of what we learned at day one, which was huge and included Samantha, but some other people as well. We got a couple of credit union leaders uh, for that. We're also going to talk about innovation, what's coming to credit unions. Then we're going to talk to a fintech founder who's partnering with credit unions right now to show you that some of that future is happening right around you. But before that, Doug, you've got a trivia question for us. So what do we got today, man? I do. I do. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And not to sound like grandpa, but have you seen the price of stamps? They're up to 66 cents now. 66 cents. They call it the forever stamp, but I think For accurate marketing, it should be called the forever rising price stamp. When I run for president, details coming soon. I propose that we go back to the times when the recipient paid for the postage. Thanks a lot, prepaid postage. Speaking of paying for postage, in 1958, famed jeweler Harry Winston paid $2.44 first class postage plus $142.05 for the insurance, which I always turn down, to mail a historical donation to the Smithsonian. What was it? It was the 45 and a half carat Hope Diamond. The dude put it in the mail. That is a lot of faith in the post office. Speaking of the post office, did you know that on this day in 1775, the US Postal Service was founded during the Second Continental Congress? Yes, and a famous founding father became the very first postmaster general and known throughout history as the founder of the U.S. Post Office and another amazing American institution. My question is, what man became the first postmaster general? I'll be back right after I try to steam these stamps off my mail. Hey there, stackers. I'm go-getter and stamp liquor sticker Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And we're talking about a historical figure that was the founding father of the post office. The first postmaster general was paid an annual salary of $1,000 plus $340 for a secretary and a comptroller. He held the position for just over 15 months. So my question is, what man became the first postmaster general? It was, of course, Benjamin Franklin, who was not only the first Postmaster General, but much more importantly, the namesake of this podcast. Truly a huge moment for his legacy and keeping him relevant to this day. And now, let's hear more relevant takeaways with Joe. We're going to open up the second half here of our interviews. Thanks, Doug, with an interview. But um, back on, on postage stamps here for just a second, there's some consternation you got there doug about Ah, postage stamps 66 cents i could walk it there cheaper there's a gentleman that we all know who uh well has an issue with postage stamps and uh you might recognize this voice stamps make me nervous (laughs) because i don't know how many you're supposed to put on like i like where they're gonna be like you should put one more on uh and they change the price of stamps and that's not in the news you know (laughs) You don't find that out on Twitter. You have to find out from old people. They're the only people that know. They keep up with their like stamps went up. You're like, okay. Uh, is it a hundred dollars a stamp? It's like they're furious. They're like, it's three more pennies. <laughs> it's three three more pennies. They're yes, furious. Pe- Does that classify us as old people or people are learning the price of stamps went up from our podcast? <laughs> Both. I got no, I got no idea. All right. At the end of day one, I was able to corral a couple of credit union leaders and Kirksey's with Elga Credit Union, which is in the great state of Michigan. Michael Abernathy is the head of this <laughs> Buckeye State. Oh, oh God, Buckeye State Credit Union. And I sat down with this classic Michigan Ohio uh, battle of what we learned on day one. All right, it's the end of day one, and I'm here with Ann Kirksey from Elga Credit Union and Mike Abernathy from Buckeye State Credit Union. So, Mike, we have to start with you, the elephant in the room. That doesn't mean you're in Ohio, does it? Oh, it absolutely does. Go Bucks. 
Oh, that is horrible. So, so Anne, why are you so awesome and Mike's not? I'm from Michigan. Oh, well, see, there we go. No. But, but, but not University of Michigan. Please, no. Go blue. Oh, no, I can't. I can't like either one of you. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no jokes. Oh, I'm so disappointed in both of you. I think our host, Jeff Klein, did this to me on purpose because I'm a Sparty. So oh. there you go. So whenever I meet, just so you know, whenever, Mike, I'm hanging out with Wolverine people, we always say, well, at least you're not a Buckeye. Exactly. And then when we're ever hanging out with Buckeyes, we go, well, at least you're not a Wolverine. Right. Because you two, well, you two hate each other more than... <laughs> anyway. Anyway, that's all fun stuff. But let's talk about something more fun, which is your members. So you're obviously here because you guys care very much about your members. You don't go, you don't invest in coming to a conference like this if you're not thinking about opportunities to be even more involved in your community. So, and here at the end of the first day, we started off hearing from a guy really to me talking about courage and getting online and being kind of where people are. Then we had kind of back to back from two speakers talking about, you know, not financial education. It's not what you know, it's what you do. And really being able to be out there helping your members kind of lead this life in this human centered design idea and then we finish it off with uh, a couple CEOs really talking about how they bring that home in different industries. What really is we end day one, finally getting my question, <laughs> as we end day one, what do you think hit you the hardest? Gosh, just building relationships with our members and how many choices are out there. I think the graph today or the visual today said that uh, most consumers have 40 plus relationships with financial companies. So what are we going to do to be different and to really offer everything that someone needs? And maybe we can't offer everything, but there's tons of choices out there. So what are we going to do? What was your biggest, Mike? Ron Shevlin reinforced something that we were already talking about, which is it's nice to have the thoughts around financial education, but financial education bluntly has fallen flat with consumers it's financial performance, and they want to see how they're performing. And it almost goes back to the gamification of you want to see how you can continue to move up in the standings and kind of keep score in a way. And, and it's very important that you're finding digital and e efficient and convenient solutions to help people on that journey because that's what it is. It's a financial journey, not just education or any other term they give to it. It's a journey to your highest potential financial performance. I want to just then focus on those two topics, because I think those are fantastic takeaways from day one. So, Anne, when we talk about all the different choices people have that you mentioned and the fact that Ron, the same guy that Mike talked about, had this slide with all of these different you know, financial apps people have, even on their phone, they have so many different relationships. It's very difficult to find your member, and yet there's so much. I always see there's so much for the credit unions can do for their members, and yet it's very difficult to find them. So how are you guys out there trying to find your members, your next potential member? Yeah, so offering, you know, really targeted marketing from a marketing standpoint and understanding where our members are and what they're doing. Um, I think, too, it's important for us to really partner with fintechs instead of trying to reinvent something that might not be as good. It's like, what can we do? Um, knowing that our members are using these things. Yeah, so some of the apps on their phone, one of the big themes today was these relationships with these cool fintech creators, these people that are so passionate about just one area. You guys also focused on fintechs, Mike? A little bit, but I would take just a slightly different approach in how we're trying to reach our potential members. And that is, I learned from a business executive that I listened to his podcast on is, in business, you can be one of three things. You can be better than, less than, or different than. Our credit union seven years ago was failing. It was really bad. And we focused on just figuring out different than. What can we do that no other bank or even credit union is doing? And that was, we focused on being a first responder to people in financial crisis mm. and being kind of the ER nurse and doctor to help get them their first loan, something they can afford and build up. And once we kind of established that relationship, we started adding layers. And so we started finding efficiencies through different fintechs. So whether it was on the mortgage side or the auto loan side, or even on personal loan side, then we started figuring out lead generation so we could reach more, like Simply Focus. Simply Focus is the key sponsor of the event. Well, there's a reason, they're awesome. They have been able to help us reach so many more people in the Northeast Ohio community. And so we've just kind of started with, this is who we're gonna be, we're going to be different from everybody else and then just grow off that 
and try to expand it. That's kind of where we go with the different philosophies of reaching, but also on the fintech side, using multiple different platforms led by Simply Focused. Well, when it comes to marketing, I think that that, that differentiation factor is what you have to do. And I mean, it's so hard. I mean, being online and doing this online, our first speaker today said that, you know, there's a bigger population of people on Facebook than there is in any country on the world. And so if you're not online, it's difficult. Like, how do you differentiate and bring out the fact that the credit union can help so many people? You know, I think it's interesting because we can tell our story as much as possible, whether we tell it online. But when I was just listening to Mike speak, I was really thinking about word of mouth because oh, yeah. I'm sure that everything that you're doing is, you know, you help one person and they tell 10 people. So I think, too, not only can we tell the stories, but we have members telling their stories online. It's funny, not even so much off online as offline. Just, yeah. if, just if we have great partnerships, those will resonate. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, we can tell our story, our members tell our story, but it's really those interactions with the members where they're sharing that. Let's pivot to what Mike talked about, which was here at the end of day one, you know, this idea that financial education programs, I agree, they don't work, but seeing these programs that are more focused on not what you know or importing more knowledge, but helping people do more, did that resonate with you too? Yeah, I thought that was all really interesting. Um, I'm not really sure what the next step is for that, how we can do that. I think, you know, we focus on teaching a lot, but how can we really look at people's behavior and help them change that behavior? Yeah. I'm not sure on that one yet. It is cool, though, because, I mean, that's a new frame, Mike, for people really looking at stuff. I know credit unions have been big into the financial education space for a long time, but this would be this kind of human-centered approach about what do they need and how do I help them be, as you said, key performers is a whole new, new, I don't know, can of worms? Yeah, it's a new can of worms, but you can also do it in stages. So a lot of what we focus around is we don't give up on education. We give up on traditional education. Uh. So we use a, an online app through your phone that uh, gamifies education. And we got somewhere around 4,000 people in the last 12 months using it, which allows you to move up the standings, to take little quizzes, and then you can earn Amazon gift cards, Walmart gift cards, and there's an incentive for people to do financial education. As we it almost gamifies it. It absolutely gamifies it. And what it does is then that next step, they're already ingrained with us, and now we get them to climb the credit mountain. And so where we have the challenge and we're trying to get better at is showing the stuff on maybe our webs or like our online banking or on our mobile app showing kind of, okay, you were here, now you're here. That's where we have to, to kind of fill the gap. And that's where fintechs come into play and having the right partners to deliver that because you can have this great plan. You can go through this whole journey of showing them their performance and, and getting better, but people want things quick. Like he said, you know, I can't remember which speaker said it, but a goldfish has the attention span of eight <laughs> seconds. That was but, Eric, the first guy. And Eric pointed out that the human has a seven-second attention span. I, I don't know. What did you say? No, I'm kidding. And, right. <laughs> well, exactly. Ted Lasso says the same thing. Be a goldfish. The reality is, is that we have to be able to get these tools and get them in front of our members and consumers as quickly as possible because they're constantly moving on to the next thing. And we want to make sure that this is consistently getting in front of them, in their eyes, their ears hearing it, and, and constantly experiencing it so it becomes valuable to them moving forward. So yes, fintechs have to play a part in that journey to financial performance. Yeah, and that's so exciting because the creators of those products, as we said earlier, just some people that just, you don't go into that business unless you're passionate about changing people's lives. We have a difference here in uh, levels of where people are at. Mike being a CEO of his organization, he can go back and set the terms and say, this is the way we're going. And then his board can say, no, maybe, and he's going elsewhere. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Ann, you've got a different game going on. You have to go to your CEO. You have to talk to them about, hey, I'm excited about this. This is something we should invest in. We heard that. A lot of the things we heard about today are going to take investments. What's something you heard today that you're excited to take back to your leadership team to invest in? Yeah, I think one thing that really struck me today was all the talk about payments. 
I think we've really, as credit unions, talked a long time about like the core products. Um, and today, Samantha really talked about the different payments and like the microtransactions. So not always be focusing on the things that only happen every five to seven years, the mortgage, the loans, but how can we be there for our members every day? Like the everyday money movement that like some of the fintechs or others are doing better than we are that we need to focus on. So it's kind of like thinking of things a little differently. Yeah. No, that's fabulous because the big thing they talked about today is if you're working with people on these day by day and minute by minute issues, then they trust you with the big things. And you're you're in the community anyway, you're a nonprofit, so they should be placing their trust in you more than a Bank of America, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we're here for them. So we want to make sure we have the products and services for them. You see, I got another negative Bank of America in there. Every <laughs> every chance I get. <laughs> And where can people find you if they need to know more about uh, your credit union? So you can find us at elgacu.com or look us up on LinkedIn. Awesome. Yours includes the horrible word, but uh, Mike, where can they where can they find you? www.buckeycu.org. And you can find us on any social media platform. Awesome. Wherever find your social media platforms are sold. No, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. You can see how there's so much great stuff that you learn at a conference, guys, which brings me, OG, to a big point here that is, frankly, nothing to do with what the great stuff Michael and Anne had to say. But if you're not going to your industry conferences, you truly are just missing out. Because as Jeff said, it's not about all these great speakers that Michael and Anne talked about and that Jeff set up for this conference. It's actually as much about what happens in the hallways and the connections you make, OG, I think you got to go to industry conferences if at all possible. Yeah, maybe one or two a year because depending on the industry that you're in, there could be sure. one every other couple, three weeks, you know. And I think the other thing that I, I get overwhelmed with and maybe other people feel the same way is you look at the schedule or you look at the agenda or you look at the time frame and you go, this thing goes Sunday through Thursday. There's breakouts every 45 minutes from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. There's dinners and parties and like... That's a lot of stuff. And the reality is, is that if you can get one or two things, or if you can go in with some prep of, I'm looking for the answer or a solution on one item or one thing I'm working on in my, in my business or in my job, go get that thing and then get the heck out of there. You know, there's no, there's no rule that says you have to be at the conference from Sunday morning to Thursday night, you know, and go to all the parties and all the breakouts, go to the ones that are important to you and then, and then try to connect with people. Like you said, yeah. Have some marketing time. How are you going to collect all the free beer koozies and keychains if you leave early, though? <laughs> well, you just make the one lap through the show, you know, <laughs> with the, the, the grab bag. bag. The grab bag, yeah. My kids love these little bouncy balls. Can I have three of them? <laughs> I think it's funny how Jeff opened up this discussion with that's the thing you really shouldn't care about, but Doug's still all about it. <laughs> like a letter opener? <laughs> yeah. So, hey, don't funny story about koozie. this letter opener. I got this at my. My first bank job in 1997. And you still have it. And I still have it from Western yes. National Life Insurance Company. All right. You can guess who bought us lunch that day. <laughs> and a letter opener, not just lunch, but wait, there's more. Exactly. And, you know, for all the letters we get, I thought it was apropos based on today's topic. I got to tell you, there were a few members of this conference that did some great prep work to your point, OG. Like not only did they go in and highlight like what sessions they really wanted to go to, and I do that now, too, because I can't stay awake for everything. I actually have to spend some time in my room by myself as a guy who pretends he's an extrovert, really needs a bunch of time away. So I will skip sessions specifically mm -hmm. just to recharge and and to start implementing the stuff. Because if I don't implement some of the stuff I learned at a conference right away, like some of the ideas I have, it gets lost in the malaise of work oh, when, I, we when know. I get home. We know when you go to conferences. We're all <laughs> uniquely aware of the conferences when you're there and when you get back. Yeah, I've never seen an introvert fake being an extrovert better than you, Joe, because at a conference, you can't peel you off the floor. Yeah, yeah, it is. I need like three days alone after a conference. But the prep work ahead of time on the people that are going to be there, what I found very cool was there were a few people OG, who, who reached out to me and said, hey, uh, if you get time to share a coffee at Relevant, it looks like, you know, we might have something in common. Now, this particular conference only had 100 people there, so you can do that. With a 6,000-person conference, you're going to have to be very choosy about who you look at with LinkedIn. I thought that was really people doing their homework and making some great connections 
by going in, you know, with, with an agenda. I really, really get discouraged when I see people walk into a conference and just go, okay, show me what you got, you know, with no prep work, no idea of what they want to learn. Like you really, I think, do have to go there with an agenda. Speaking of that, our agenda on today's episode is to tell you not only, like Samantha said earlier, where where credit unions should be going and some of the ideas that Michael and Ann shared, but what are some of the possibilities for the future? Well, Brian Scott's the chief growth officer at PSCU, and he kicked off our second day of the conference by diving into some of the cool, cool, innovative tech happening around the world that we might see back here. I'm here with Brian Scott. Brian, how are you? I'm doing great. It's great to be here. Well, it was great listening to your presentation. I have to tell you, so this is going to be an old guy story for all of our stackers out there, but you'll appreciate this. I remember I was in second grade and we had this presentation about how the world of buying things was going to change. And listen to this. We would be able to, at the grocery store, scan our own groceries. And then you could pay for them using a machine. And I was like, holy cow, it's, it's like the Jetsons, right? And now, of course, I go in and I'm like, oh, damn, I got to scan my own groceries. And I use the little machine there. But what's cool is you're a guy that looks at this stuff all the time. How did, how did you get involved uh, talking about growth and how banks and credit unions can grow? Yeah, I mean, it's super interesting. If you look across the world, there's financial institutions doing really cool and unique and interesting things. And here in the U.S., maybe not as much. And we think we're technologically advanced here in the U.S., but when you compare us to stuff that's happening around the world, we're not. And so I got super interested because I had a discussion with a credit union CEO who was from Ukraine. I was like, wow, must be great having all this technology here. And he's like, actually, Ukraine's so much better. Yeah, and it started me really looking like, what's the rest of the world doing? And figuring out, yeah, they're far more advanced than us. So that's kind of spurred my interest in this. And it's kind of been a rabbit hole. You keep going down and finding really cool stuff that's happening in other parts of the world and hoping, how do we bring that here? Well, let's talk about that, because you talked on two fronts this morning to us. First of all, to your point of around the world, and then second, some of the cool things, like you gave us a great story about Nordstrom and some stuff they're doing. But let's start there. Let's start with around the world, about Africa and Asia and other places. Well, some of these things, like M-Pesa in Kenya, it came out of necessity. So they didn't have landline phone lines. Poor country. It's hard to install landline phone lines, but super easy to put up a pop-up cell tower and sell $1 cell phones that just, you know, the basic Nokia flip phone whatever. And people started using their phones to trade things like minutes. Minutes became like a currency. And all of a sudden, the phone company is now acting like a bank. They're People are storing minutes as money. They're using minutes to pay other people. They actually start... It's almost like a broker. Yeah, they also start lending minutes. And so now all of a sudden, the phone company in Kenya is as good or better than a bank. And it was just born out of necessity. People needed a way to pay each other. And because cell phones were so ubiquitous, more so than in the U.S., that became the predominant technology. What might we see from that here in the future? Do you see there, is there any takeaway for the U.S. and U.S. banks based on some of that cool stuff happening in Africa? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for us is we have to let regulations get out of the way. We so overregulate. And I talked this morning about one of the first things when new technology comes out, people are like, how are we going to regulate that? How are we going to prevent bad actors? Other countries focus on how do we use this for good? How do we use this for cool things? So I think part of it is our regulation mindset that we need to get out of the way of. That's interesting. Well, it makes me think, you know, ACH is still here, right? I mean, three, three days. It's the same as it was in like 1993 when I started my career. Right. And, you know, there's countries like Japan that have had real time payments for 40 years. Like, how are we not as advanced as Japan in that? So, yeah. Come on, we could be Japan. Come on. I don't know. Let's talk about here some cool stuff we're seeing. You talked about companies. Let's talk about Nordstrom as an example. Some of the experience changing for people and this this is good, for I think, for all of us. Yeah, so there's a lot of companies like Nordstrom that are starting to invest in in-branch or in-store versus for the last 10 years, a lot of people were thinking digital. We have to go digital. And so Nordstrom is thinking about how do we invest in-store and create an in-store experience that's so exceptional, you want to go into the store. And when you do, you have a great experience and you keep coming back to in-store and you know, in-store sales are up. And so what they're doing is They'll track you exactly where you are in the store. They'll bring you things that they think you want. This part felt big brother at first. I was like, so if anybody's listening to this and they're going, ooh, I don't know if I like this. Wait, there's more. Yeah, but wait, there's more. (laughs) And so if they bring me a Tommy Bahama shirt that they think I'll like, 
and it's like, oh yeah, it's in my size, it looks like something I'd buy, then they'll say, you could buy it here today for $120, or you can go down the street and get it from Nordstrom Rack for 60. Or we'll ship it to you, and we'll also only charge you $60 because it's on sale there, just not here. And now all of a sudden it goes from big brother to, oh, you've got my best interest in mind. Every time I come into your store, I'm gonna make sure my app's on so you're tracking me, you know where I'm at, you know what I'd like, and hopefully you're gonna bring me better deals in the future, so. And your big point this morning was, from a business standpoint, because here we're, we're really, with, you know, credit unions are businesses, nonprofit businesses, but still businesses. The overarching message, I think, was was that they already made the sale. They had a ton of, of profit that they just gave away, but they're seeing the big picture. A hundred percent. And so, like, how many times does, from a credit union perspective, a member come in and say, yeah, I'm ready to take that auto loan for 5.9%. And you say, you know what, we can get you a better deal. Like you've already made that sale and very few times would a credit union or a bank make that decision to say, no, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help you make a better financial decision, even though it costs me money. And then that trust creates a customer for life. It creates a customer for life and it creates word of mouth. It creates all the other positive things. So there's an investment you're making by creating that trust. Brian, I would say that's marginally cooler than scanning your own groceries. <laughs> scanning your own groceries is the worst. I absolutely hate it. I hate it. The future is not as cool as it's seems. Brian, thanks for hanging out for a second. Hey, thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. This is Chris from Heavy Metal Money. When I'm not raging in a mosh pit, I'm stacking Benjamins. Thanks to Brian. I always love like watching the Jetsons. I'm like, wow, we can, we can look at a TV and we'll see each other and we can talk via TV. It's amazing. Maybe we'll call it like a Zoomer, something like that. How cool would that be? Me, George Jetson. Do, 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 do. But I like this idea about making banking more high touch, OG, because we see so many companies use technology to cut people. And I know, Doug, this is was a big part of your career, not cutting people through tech. The well, axe. <laughs> the axe man. So they called him the Grim Reaper. I, I could have introduced that a little better. I, I set up a lot of meetings late on a Friday afternoon for right. people. Where people are bringing their crate full of You invested stuff. in boxes. <laughs> Bankers boxes. But no, you can use tech to just cut, 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 and you cut the, the customer experience and the customer relationship with the brand. Or, Doug, you can make that relationship like Nordstrom is, where it brings you closer. Credit unions have this opportunity to do the same. Yeah, they definitely can. You know, I did. I worked in technology for years, and I can't remember a time, at least not one that comes to mind, where any of the big projects that we were working on, sole purpose was to eliminate people. It was typically to enhance or add services, which I think is what you're getting at, which is which is what the financial industry really ought to be focusing their time on. I, uh, I This is not in the financial industry, but I just had an experience that was fantastic. I was on a, a really huge photography retailer, B&H Photo, in uh, New York City, chatting about a product via IM, just, you know, text. I had a question that they couldn't answer without showing me the product, and they said, do you want us to convert this to a video call and we'll connect you with somebody in our store and they can show you the product. That's cool. That I thought was a fantastic use of technology to actually enhance the human, as you called it, the touch factor, right? I mean, virtual touch, but what a great way to do that. And I'm sure that actually means they need more people to be able to handle handle all the yokels like me that are out in the hinterlands that, you know, have some question about photography gear and they're going to do a video chat with me in the store. It was awesome. Guy Raz did a great interview with the guy that helped turn around Best Buy, linking the store experience to the online experience. And uh, we'll link to that as another indicator of what Brian's talking about is possible. You know, one of the speakers, I don't remember who it was, talked about the number of banking related apps we have. And because of banks going all technology that we don't have the loyalty that we used to have. And I thought about I thought about mine. I have I have my credit union. I actually have two different credit unions that I'm involved with, Navy Federal and MSU Federal Credit Union. I've got a community bank. I have a Venmo account. I have a PayPal account. I think they're, oh, and I have a different bank. You know, we have two different banks for the business. So I've got seven different banking relationships on my phone just because we've used technology to cheapen those relationships. And then you think through the different credit cards that you have as well, which are 
often tied to banking like JP Morgan Chase uh, or Capital One as examples. There's even more. So being able to make that an experience more and bring people closer to their credit union, I think is really cool. A guy who's done this, who's in fintech right now is a gentleman named Chris Bonsamino. Chris is super passionate about what he does. But what's amazing to me is, is Chris's background. We're going to start off talking about his background and then really showing how some of this future Brian talked about is happening today. And rounding out our coverage of CU Relevant, Chris Bonsamino is here. How are you, man? Hey, Joe, I'm 100%. I love it. Thank you for having me today. Well, it's funny. When you and I spoke originally at the conference, I don't think either one of us were 100% because we've been through three days of just <laughs> fantastic talks and our heads were full. And of course, uh, just all the stuff that comes with Vegas. So you've recovered. Very much so. Yeah, I, uh, I can see straight again. Uh, everything is back at 100%. And I'm glad to be here today. Well, you know, we just talked to Brian Scott about what's practical, uh, what, what is possible in tech, but you're truly on the front edge, on the fintech front edge. But I got to ask you, whenever I talk to a fintech founder, there's somebody like you, Chris, I look at your resume. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, why do I leave some of these cushy ass jobs <laughs> that they had these, these with these companies, some great names that people know to do what they do? Can you talk about where you used to work first and, and how you got going more on a fintech uh, motion? <laughs> Sure, be happy to. First of all, I love being a fintech founder today. And the reason I love it so much is that the action is on the frontier. Like it is a frontier job. It is never the same day twice. The highs are higher, the lows are lower, but it's all action all the time. My background is, you know, I was a corporate person for a long time. I was most recently an executive at Visa. Always doing Never heard of it. Tell, tell us about that company. I don't know what you're... No, I'm kidding. Yeah, Visa, the large global network. <laughs> yeah. In particular, the global part, I, I lived and worked with uh, my family in Asia for half of my tenure at Visa. Um, always wanted to be in Asia. Uh, if you're familiar with those markets, many of them are all digital. And to me, as a payments professional, being in and working on and, and developing the frontier in those markets is, is why uh, that particular... Um, part of my career is, is important. Being at Visa for Australia, for China, for India during demonetization, for what's happening in Korea and across Southeast Asia, those payment markets, we have a lot to learn from what they're doing in those markets today. And, uh, and we want to bring that to the US. So my background at Visa for eight years, I was at PayPal before that, all those tweaking and building and um, hopefully they're using those products today because I, I worked hard on them. What are some of those things in Asia that you're trying to bring to America? Well, I think it's it's very notable. And a lot of people have looked at like China in particular at the super apps, right? Love them or hate them. You know, like they're very interesting. Um, there's two in particular. There's WeChat Pay and Alipay. And basically in the span of about six years, they moved from being online only payment methods to cleaning up 90% of all mobile payments in the market today. And it's all digital. That means there's no cards. Uh, there's like uh, essentially no interchange and interchange is the method by which merchants sort of pay for the ability to use the payment method that flows back to the consumer. My point here is when there's no interchange, there's no method to create a reward structure, like a pay, like a cashback reward structure for consumers. So how do you motivate people so quickly to use your payment method? And when you look at it and you look at those payment methods, you see that since they're on device, they're totally mobile. They're light years ahead of where we are in the US today, which is basically plastic, just touching the edges of digital. So what happens when it's on the device? Well, first of all, your fraud goes right to the floor because you can validate. Secondly, at the moment of the payment, you can activate a whole bunch of experiences. Yes, there are rewards. You can do offers better. You can locate the consumer better. You can tell them things about the payment. You can activate a buy now, pay layer facility. You can gamify the experience. All those things can happen when you have a device in the equation. We've been trying Not when to, you have a plastic card. Well, sure. And we've been trying to, uh, you know, this entire episode, we've talked about how credit unions are just trying to get people's attention to, to, to let them know that they have so many things that they can do well and a reward structure around like their debit card, as an example, could be a huge win for them. I do have a question for you about payments in general, which is on our Monday show, Chris, we reported on, of course, this new news from last week about the Fed 
changing uh, uh, changing the game a little bit when it comes to payments. How do you see this new Fed program as affecting what you do? Is this finally the end of ACH? <laughs> uh, time will tell. I, I can tell you this about Fed now. You know, so this is a long time and going. I think whenever you look at anything in payments, in particular consumer payments and payments at the point of sale, it's always a very long game. It, it always is. And consumer behavior is very entrenched. You know, it is it is hard to change your behavior and my behavior at the physical point of sale and elsewhere. So I, I think there's definitely some structural benefits to, to what's happening and the, the yeah. Fed should do it. When it flows most immediately to what we're talking about today and payments, retail payments, it's going to be a long time before some of these technologies make their way all the way to the edge like that. So I'm pretty confident that the work we're talking about it today, the technology and the platform, the SRM key moments is what we're talking about. Yeah, It's going to benefit credit unions for a long time. And it's definitely something we should be activating on today to engage members and drive more payment volume. Well, let's take this uh, cerebral discussion we're having and let's really dive in because with SRM, you, sir, have uh, worked with a credit union near and dear to my heart, Michigan State University Federal Credit <laughs> Union. That's so right. as an example of the work that you're doing, talk about how you help this credit union kind of work with their members. MSUFCU, Michigan State University Federal Credit Union, has for a long time been super active and super progressive with all the products. That they, and they're, they're, they're out there. Like they're just a fantastic credit union to work with. What we did for MSU FCU, we created a real-time method to engage their members at the point of sale. So when you pull an MSU FCU card out of your wallet, and I actually have one right here. It's got a Spartan right on <laughs> there. There you go. And you use it in the real-time payment moment. I'm talking like a 1,000 milliseconds after you swipe your card at a Jamba Juice, let's say, on your device in the MSU FCU app up, you know, we know when a payment alert comes up, it says $8 at Jamba Juice, confirms the merchant, but then opens to a larger experience in the MSU FCU app. And that experience could be three more offers that you can add to your MSU FCU wallet for other purchases around you and save money. It could be if you're a low transactor, a challenge campaign to get a reward after say five more transactions. These are the types of things that we're focusing for and around members to bring confirmation to the payment and add value to the payment simultaneously. You told me, Chris, and we were live too. It's great because people wouldn't get any confirmation of their transaction at all before right. you did this. And so in terms of fraud, it's also very helpful to know, oh yeah, I made this, I made this thing. Or if somebody's somehow gotten a hold of my card, I didn't make that transaction. Yeah. Payment alerts are good hygiene. Uh, in fact, all the networks have a, a reg for a payment alert and how the credit union or the, or the issuer decides that that's their own business. But payment alerts stop fraud. You know, the stories never end about people like waking up in the morning and seeing like a payment alert from some gas pump in the middle of America. Like I wasn't there last what? night. And, and then you could take action. That's that's what that's all about. Our, our point, though, and our hypothesis is that payment alert is important. But why stop there? Why not take that payment alert, turn it a little bit further, pull it into the credit union's app, and then maximize it with an experience that's interesting to them? And we can gamify it. We can put a scratch card behind it. We can tell them about another product that the credit union is selling. Like, that's a great moment for a cross-sell. You know, you've got a 5.12% CD. Like, put that information out there and, and get some action going across the credit. That's what the whole platform SRM key moments is about, is using that key moment of the payment to apply other useful things to the moment and give that to the member. And I know some of our stackers, Chris, are thinking, wow, some of this sounds, you know, maybe a little manipulative. Sounds like, you know, we're doing these things to entice people to access their checking account. But I want our stackers to think about what's going on at Bank of America and what's going on at Wells Fargo, where they're already doing this stuff. Like they, They've been doing this stuff forever. And the fact that credit unions can go to the cutting edge, and these are organizations where the members are owners, that this just helps people deal with an organization like a credit union versus some of these big banks. Oh, gosh, help them, for sure. There is a vast universe of 
helpful things <laughs> that you could bring to a member in the payment moment that don't exist today. A plastic card doesn't have a screen and it doesn't have an antenna to reach out of the internet. When you've got a device in the app, the app that you are trying to get your members to use, your own app, activate that thing. Your Bank of America examples are good. I look a little more global. Sure. You know, for example, I've seen this use case come up over and over of like when your members travel and say they're taking their, their credit cards abroad. Excellent. Like you can tell them in real time when they land in a vacation in Italy, Joe, you're going to Italy, let's say, and you spend, uh, I like this story so far. Uh, yeah, you spend a uh, hundred Euro. What is that going to settle at? You probably don't know, you know, or, or if you spend a million, 1.2 million Vietnamese dong, what's that going to be in USD? Nobody knows, <laughs> but you can, since you've got your app and we listen to the transaction feed in these key moments, you can instantly say, you know, 1.2 million Vietnamese dong, that's $23.67. And that's immediately helpful to your traveling member and a day-to-day -day payment problem. You can do it abroad, but the same situations and, and utility elements exist here in the U.S. It's just opening up and thinking what should be done in the moment. I think it's so powerful and so helpful, but it could also be just some fairly very light, just fun games to get people involved. I know when Michigan sure. State has sporting events, you help them put together put together some yeah, playful yeah. stuff around sporting events. Right. And look, for a credit union, evaluate what you have in inventory. And by that, I mean sponsorship properties local events you want to talk about in MSU FCU's case, they have a very tight relationship with the university, the Spartans, uh, Michigan State University. In fact, they have women's basketball and men's basketball and hockey and football. The same platform powers um, what they call MSU FCU game day. And what happens on like a football, home football game, like two hours prior to kickoff, members get a notification that says it's game day and they play a little 25 second long game. Actually really fun. And um, you kick a football, for example, through the GoPlus. And you know, it's actually really fun. But then every time you use your payment card on game day, you get another chance to play. And what we see is the college students really getting excited about this. Um, but the point is, when you drive over 20, I think it's 26% engagement, um, you don't get those results through mail or email. These things are connecting with things that the members care about at MSU FCU and doing some really fun things. The same thing can be done for you. We've got some other clients that um, have similar gamify experiences around their, their music venues, uh, around other sporting venues. That's how you take those investments you've made and really turn them up and make them valuable. That's fabulous. And then, and then intersect with them. People think about their money more often and they do a better sure. job of managing their money, fighting fraud, all the above. Chris, man, if people are here with the credit union, they want to find out more about the work you do. How do they find you? Sure. Um, you can go, uh, SRM Key Moments is available through the company SRM Strategic Resource Management. So um, reach out through the website, or you can reach me directly at cbonsamino at srmcorp.com. And that's a long one. Maybe we've got some- Oh, you uh, know what we'll do, like Chris? A, yeah. We'll put it in the foot. <laughs> we will. We'll put it in the show notes at stackybenjamins.com. How about that? Okay, that's the, probably yeah. the best way to do it. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Chris, uh, connect. I, I love the one two punch of you and Brian. Brian showing what's possible and you showing, nope, it's possible right now, man. <laughs> Thanks for hanging Thank out you. with us for a minute. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Phenomenal. How the future happening right now. Big thanks to Chris for hanging out. Hey, time to wrap this thing before we zip, zip, send zip, it over zip, zip. to Doug. Oh. <laughs> the other wrap. Oh. To see exactly uh, what we should have learned today. But before that, again, we are uh, celebrating Kate's birthday coming up. She's got a big, 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 big milestone birthday coming up. And we're going to give away some Sennheiser wireless, over-the-ear, noise-canceling headphones. Great headphones. Sennheiser's the same mics that our friends at NPR use to make those podcasts that are nearly as good as this one. Go to stackybenjamins.com slash birthday bash. And if you sign up for the 201, our newsletter that goes over what we talked about on Monday, Wednesday, on our Tuesday, Thursday episodes. By the way, you can, if you happen to accidentally miss an episode, and I know how much that hurts you, still you can read the 201. Kevin does a great job of making sure that uh, that's written 
agnostically. But stackybenjamins.com slash birthday bash. If you already get the 201 we thought about you too, we'll give you an entry and your friend an entry when you refer somebody using your unique referral code. And you'll find that referral code inside the 201. That is that. Last but not least, if you're not here for a newsletter or to win some Sennhauser wireless headphones or to celebrate Kate's birthday or any of that, you're here because you really, really need a better team in your corner. Head to stackybedjamins.com slash OG. That's where you go to get on OG's calendar because he and his team are taking clients. And if you have done not as much as you should have when it comes to your financial planning so far this year, you still got a few months left to get going. Stackybedjamins.com slash OG. All right. I think that puts a pin in it. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from our guests and ask your local credit union what they can do for you. You just might be surprised by the range of services they offer. Second, getting started with investing? Don't worry so much about great diversification. Find a broad index like the total stock market and dive in. Later, use tools like the Efficient Frontier to help your money grow wings. But the big lesson? Listen, I tried my postal hack. Turns out postal workers don't like it when you walk their entire route with them. Thanks to Jeff, Mike, Ann, Samantha, Brian, and Chris for joining us today. You can find out more about all of their work in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lacey Langford, who's also the host of the Military Money Show, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Guys, I saw this while I'm searching TikTok furiously for uh, some some great stuff for our show. This has nothing to do with money, but I think we all need a friend like uh, like this. <laughs> what were you searching TikTok furiously for, Joe? <laughs> for, for for late at night? Like no, no, for for fin- financial tips. Oh, uh, right. Yes. Uh, I get lots of hilarity, but this, uh, this one, um, this is a special kind of friend who attended his, uh, buddy's wedding. This is my buddy, Bobby. Uh, he was an usher at my wedding and he had one request and that was to wear a kilt. And why did you wear the kilt, Bobby? Well, later on in the night, I thought it'd be a great idea to dye my uh, balls green with food coloring. And then what did you do once you had green balls and a kilt? I walked around, I mingled, and I showed everyone my 
privates, i.e. balls, saying, lifted up my kilt and said, Hulk smash. Yeah. How many times did my sister-in-law see your balls at my wedding? 19. And was there anything you learned from this experience? It takes approximately three weeks to get food coloring off human skin. Four weeks on the crinkled skin down there. <laughs> what? All the, all the stuff you don't want to know. Stuff that shows up in your <laughs> your automatic TikTok. feed, Joe, is really just beyond me. What were your search terms? I mean, I got like airplane videos on YouTube, occasionally some stuff about the Marine I'm not Corps. Even searching. I know, that's the point. I no no, I get it. I'm just No, flipping. I get it. I know how it works. It's yes. it's based on what you have recently looked at. So I got a lot of comedians in oh my, my God. in my search history. Not sure why. How many times did my sister-in-law see your green balls? 21. He says with a totally straight face, 21. Wow. Fun times. Yes. Thanks for sharing, Joe. You're going to want to delete your search history, bro. Start over. Clear the cache, buddy. Clear the cache. Start over. Get a new computer. Uh, That was very funny. That was good stuff.